The world has received some very sad news today. Queen Elizabeth II has been around for almost everybody's lifetime. At 96 years old, she was the longest reigning British monarch ever who took the throne when she was only 25 years old in 1952 and has reigned for 70 years. She stood for stability and order and was revered around the world, even outlasting 12 US presidents. But her kingdom seems to be in turmoil at the moment following her tragic passing and it seems like the nation is understandably extremely overwhelmed by the news. As a tremendously popular and influential figure, it's hard to imagine what will happen now. And although we are all reacting to her passing in our own way, so many unanswered questions remain about what will happen in the palace. But what you might not know is that there's actually a super detailed plan in place that needs to be followed to a T. I'm your host Bridget Shields and let's talk about the top 10 things that will happen now that Queen Elizabeth II has unfortunately passed away. Number 10, Operation London Bridge. The plan following Queen Elizabeth's passing is codenamed London Bridge, even though details of the plan were leaked to the press. Behind the scenes, events will unfold like clockwork precision as it's crucial to the operation that the chain of communication is followed exactly as planned in order to control the spread of the news correctly, as the information must be brought to the British government first before the world finds out. In fact, a similar plan was followed when Prince Philip, the Queen's husband, died in April last year. When the Queen passes, a number of strict measures will immediately come into play. First, the Queen's private secretary directly informs the Prime Minister and the Privy Council Office, which works with both the monarchy and the government. The Queen's private secretary is supposed to use the code words, London Bridge is down. Then the Prime Minister will host urgent calls with the Cabinet Secretary and the Senior Cabinet. From there, the Foreign Office will inform the 15 governments and the 39 nations in the rest of the Commonwealth to let them know the news. So it's really crucial to the monarchy that the information is very well contained before it becomes public knowledge. If you're loving this video so far, please hit that like button, it would really help us out. Number nine, the bells will toll. Once all the really important people know, everyone else across the United Kingdom and the world will find out. You'll probably remember for the rest of your life where you were when you heard the news. In London, the ceremonial traditions of the British monarchy will begin. National flags will be immediately flown at half mast on all government and civic buildings, like churches and the royal palaces across the UK. This should happen within 10 10 minutes of the news being broadcast to the world. Then official gun salutes will be arranged in London at all saluting garrison stations. In the immediate hours after the Queen's passing is announced, the bells will toll in churches all around London. Not only that, but the famous tenor bell at Westminster Abbey will be heard, which is only ever rung in the event of a royal death. St Paul's Great Tom will also toll. Britain will enter a period of mourning before the funeral, and multiple businesses will close for around 10 days. Things like theatres, clubs and sporting events. Only at this time will full details of the royal funeral be issued, along with details of a national minute silence. Number eight, Prince Charles will be king. Although there will be rituals and ceremonies, the prince does not actually need any of that to become king. It happens immediately. Despite the fact that some British citizens don't want Prince Charles to be king, the moment that the queen passes, he officially becomes the sovereign and will go through a kind of transformation that is carried out ceremonially and legally the very next day. And yes, there is also a codename for Charles's ascension to the throne. It's called Operation Springtide. The very first visitor to the new king has to be the prime minister. And in order to ensure a smooth transition to the new official head of state, all members of parliament will gather to swear allegiance to Charles. These steps were also carried out just hours after Queen Elizabeth's father, King George VI, died way back in 1952. On the evening of Elizabeth's passing, Charles will address the nation and give a televised speech at 6 p.m., which the whole world will likely be watching. The next day, senior government figures will proclaim Charles's ascension to the throne at St. James Palace at 11 a.m. and he will be proclaimed king. Trumpets will sound, the flag will be raised up, and cannons will go off in a royal salute. Number seven, succession will change. After Charles becomes king, Prince William, one of Queen Elizabeth's grandchildren, will move up and take the position called heir apparent. And after his father's coronation, Prince William will assume the title of Prince of Wales in a separate ceremony. Charles's current Currently called the Prince of Wales, as that title is traditionally given to the next in line to the throne. This would make Kate Middleton the Princess of Wales, but because this was Diana's title, she might choose a different one, just out of respect for her late mother-in-law. Which is kind of like how Charles's current wife, Camilla, uses her own title, the Duchess of Cornwall. So the Queen's passing would totally change the line of succession, and put William and Kate's children a lot closer to the throne. So George would become second in line, Charlotte would be third, and little Louis would be fourth in line. 
Lion, and Prince Harry will still technically remain below them in fifth place to the throne. Interestingly enough, the original law stated that younger male heirs would be considered for the throne before their older female siblings. However, in 2013, this all changed, and now any older female sibling born after the 28th of October, 2011, can be considered first for the throne. So because Princess Charlotte was born in 2015, she gets to keep her place in line. Number six, mega crowds. There will be a massive outpouring of grief as soon as the public finds out, which might be similar to the wave of emotion felt after Princess Diana's death in 1997. This is because most people never knew a time when Queen Elizabeth wasn't queen, and so they won't even be able to imagine the moment when the queen passes. For the British people, it will be a moment of tremendous grief and will likely be very overwhelming. According to documents obtained by Politico, there is concern that the number of people who will come to London to mourn Queen Elizabeth could number into the hundreds of thousands, which could really present a logistical nightmare for the city. It's more than possible that the sheer amount of people will overwhelm the transportation systems, the hospitality industry, basic services, and even policing and crowd control. Like after Prince Philip's death last year, when Buckingham Palace requested that the public not gather outside the royal residences to leave tributes because of the pandemic, and a whole bunch of people did anyway. Not only that, but it's hard to imagine people not gathering after the Queen's death, if only to leave notes, mementos, and bouquets of flowers. Number five, royal tour. When his position is solidified and Prince Charles becomes king, it will be time to get to work, even before his mother's funeral. After a short period of grieving and official condolences for the family, the new king will embark on a tour of the UK prior to the funeral, visiting Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales. He will meet leaders and attend services, as well as go out and meet the people. Although it seems like a very difficult task to anyone, especially because he would still be grieving, Charles has been training for this moment his entire life, so he's going to be well prepared. Not only that, but going to meet his subjects will be very good for his image, as he will really need to do the work to encourage positive feelings among the public about his new position. Because the truth is that many Brits think that Prince Charles wouldn't be a good king. One of the main arguments is that he just simply doesn't possess the charm and warmth that Princess Diana had. He comes across as aloof, and the New Yorker once described him as a snob. In general, he just never really tried to relate to ordinary people, while Prince William, on the other hand, has reached out to people just as much as his mother did, and is thought of as a much more compassionate person. Number four, the Queen's funeral. As the protocol goes, Queen Elizabeth II will be moved from Buckingham Palace to the Palace of Westminster for the public viewing of her casket at Westminster Hall, where she will lie in state, where the military procession from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Hall will be lined with crowds, wishing her a final farewell. The Queen will have a state funeral, and on the 10th day after her passing, the Queen's body will be moved into Westminster Abbey for an elaborate state funeral where several world leaders will be in attendance. Although the UK currently has no legal limit on how many people can attend funerals, there may still be limits on who will be there. The day of the funeral is to be an official day of mourning in Britain, and the nation will quite literally come to a halt that day, as crowds are expected to be gathered on the street as well. After the funeral at Westminster Abbey, the Queen's body will be brought home to Windsor Castle outside of London, where many members of the royal family over the centuries have been buried at St George's Chapel, as her final resting place will be beside Prince Philip, where some other monarchs and royal family members are also buried. Number three, Charles's coronation. The ceremony won't happen for several months to allow time for a mourning period and preparation. But once the Queen has been laid to rest, the palace will get to work and organize a coronation for the new King of England. For instance, Queen Elizabeth ascended the throne after her father died in 1952, but her official coronation was only held a year and a half later to allow an appropriate length of time between a monarch's passing and holding a celebration to crown the heir. Charles will then pick his name, as British monarchs are allowed to pick their own ruling name when they take the throne. Like Queen Elizabeth's father, King George VI, who was known as Bertie, but he chose to be King George after his father, King George V. Elizabeth, on the other hand, had a far easier choice, since her birth name is the same name as another one of England's great queens, Elizabeth I. So there's been a ton of speculation that Charles would choose a different name when he is crowned, like George after his grandfather or Philip after his father. But chances are he'll end up keeping his name and just become King Charles III. Number two, Camilla will be queen. Although it didn't always seem likely, it's become quite apparent that Camilla will be named queen consort, because according to experts, the longer that she's actually married to Prince 
Charles before he ascends the throne, and the bigger her public profile becomes, the more likely it is that she'll be formally styled as queen when Charles becomes king. So why was it thought that she'd never officially be queen even though she's married to Charles? Well, it has a lot to do with her choice of current title. Technically, as the wife of the Prince of Wales, Camilla is entitled to be called the Princess of Wales, but because that was Princess Diana's title, she instead chose to use the Duchess of Cornwall, out of an apparent respect for her memory. So based on the fact that she chose to keep her lesser title, there was speculation at the time of her marriage to Charles that she might be called Princess Consort instead of Queen when Charles becomes King. But as her popularity has steadily increased over the years, this seems less likely now. Although to anyone who is unaware of the history between Charles, Camilla and Princess Diana, I couldn't recommend enough that you look into it and find out why Camilla was so unpopular in the first place. And coming in at number one, uncertainty. Although there is much debate about what happens when the Queen passes in terms of the continuation of the monarchy, chances are that everything will stay the same. Despite the rumours, Prince William will never be king before Prince Charles. But the thing is that Charles is still likely to have a very short reign due to his age. Unlike his mother, who unexpectedly became queen at just 25 years old, 73-year-old Prince Charles has spent his entire life in preparation to wear the crown. As of now, he is the longest waiting heir apparent, and he will be the oldest British monarch ever to take the throne. And there is still a lot of uncertainty as to when that will happen. But after his own passing, the monarchy will continue to streamline and modernise as the younger generation takes the reins. But it's slightly less clear what will happen to the Commonwealth, which is the association of independent former colonies that accounts for almost a third of the world's population. In 2018, the Queen insisted that it was her sincerest wish that Charles carry on as head of the Commonwealth, to which all the government leaders agreed, and officially announced to the press that he would take her place when she passes. Well, that's it. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video.